Welcome to Money Week Interviews. In this series, I will be speaking with a wide range of fund managers to discuss their views on the market and where investors can find the best opportunities today. In this interview, I sat down with Anthony Chow, co-founder of Agronomics, to talk about the cellular agriculture market and why it has the potential to revolutionise how we think about food. I do hope you enjoy the interview as much as I did, and please stay tuned for more Money Week interviews. So thank you for joining us, Anthony. Thanks for having me. So to start, could you tell us a little bit about Agronomics, uh, its history, and what it's looking to accomplish? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Agronomics is a London-listed investment company focused exclusively in the field of cellular agriculture. Uh, my co-founder, Jim Mellon, and I set this up uh, back in 2019. Uh, and since then, we've raised about 135 million pounds of capital. We've got solid institutional backing uh, from the likes of BlackRock uh, and Canaccord, and we build a portfolio of around 20 or just more than 20 companies uh, in this niche but rapidly advancing field. So what is what is this field? Do, if you could give us a brief overview of what you're looking at and how the field has developed. Cellular agriculture, in our view, has three key pillars to it. Um, there's the cell culture companies, there's the precision fermentation companies, and then there's, there's the enabling technologies uh, for each of those. Uh, cell culture companies are very exciting. They're apl applying biotech methods to the production of meat, seafood, uh, and leather. Um, but these are a little bit further over the horizon than the precision fermentation uh, technologies, which are looking to produce dairy, eggs, collagen, palm oil, and, and many other things. Uh, and then finally, the enabling technologies is really an other category. We've got one uh, significant investment there, which is uh, infrastructure play, uh, which is gonna support this industry uh, get to scale. So let's uh, dig into the cell culture technologies a little bit more, because I think that's what most people will have heard about the most, yeah. and this is creating products like meat and fish yes. from cells. I exactly, so the first cultivated meat burger was actually produced in uh, 2016 by Professor Mark Post uh, at Maastricht University. It cost 250,000 euros to produce uh, and was served live on BBC here in London. Um, today, that company claims to be able to produce a beef patty at around nine euros, uh, which is obviously a very significant uh, fall in costs. Um, but you know, we believe that there is a path to cost parity for all proteins produced using this technology, um, but not all proteins are created equal. So at the front end of the curve, you're gonna have things like bluefin tuna, which are relatively high value proteins because they can't be farmed. Uh, and then at the back end, you're gonna have chicken, which is just gonna take longer uh, to get there. But you know, the reality is that animals are just inherently very inefficient at converting calories of feed to calories of flesh. Uh, and that is why cellular agriculture is being pursued uh, primarily for its uh, environmental credentials. Why, why is beef so much easier? You've talked about it, it's come, the price has gone down massively for beef, but people are still struggling with chicken. I think if you could talk a bit about that, because that gives an interesting insight into the whole industry. Well, well, the entire industry still is yet to bring the cost uh, down substantially. Um, there are only two products that have been approved in the US, uh, one from Upside, uh, foods and the other from uh, Eat Just or Good Meat, their, their cultivated meat subsidiary. So cost, uh, for costs to come down, scale needs to go up. Um, and that scale hasn't been achieved just yet. And really the, the thing constraining it is just the amount of time that this industry has been around. It is still a relatively new industry. Um, and in fact, the regulatory pathway for cultivated meat products in the US was only clarified uh, towards the end of uh, 2022. So let's let's be clear that this is there is a there is a there's the cost, but there's also an environmental cost. This yes. is not just about making a really cheap product. This is about the whole package. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Um, in fact, we contend that there's not another technology out there that has the potential to increase the world's food supply while decreasing the resource uh, intensity of its production. So there are benefits in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you've got the animal welfare benefits. Uh, but uh, the water usage for production of, of, of meat is really, really high. Uh, and then you've got other challenges like the uh, extensive use of antibiotics uh, because intensive animals that, uh, that are farmed in such close quarters, if one gets sick, they all get sick. So um, they need to be prophylactically dosed with antibiotics to preventing all of uh, them getting sick. But you know, with all of those benefits uh, that come with cellular agriculture, 
uh, I think the reality is that this will be driven by food security and surety of supply chains. We're getting direct feedback from potential customers of portfolio companies that what they're really concerned about is the price volatility of their inputs um, because you only need something like avian flu, which wipes out a huge flock of birds. Uh, and then you see spikes in the cost of albumin and eggs more broadly. Uh, and that is very hard for these food producing companies to deal with. So, okay, so there are, there are multiple factors at play here. This is not a, just making something as cheap as possible. It's about considering the environment. It's considering the supply chain. It is. It's, it's a whole package of measures that's, that there are more than one end one more than one end result for this. Yeah, that's right. But also, I don't want to take away from the need to hit price parity and the importance of that. Uh, food today is very cheap, probably artificially cheap, uh, because the indirect costs of its production, uh, and primarily the carbon, carbon emissions, are not included uh, in the cost uh, to end users. But if we don't hit uh, parity in terms of price, taste, and convenience for all of these products, then this industry will not have the broad impact that it promised us uh, to have. And you know, it accounts for up to 25% of all greenhouse gas emissions from, uh, come from animal husbandry. It's huge. So there is, there is money and money flowing into this sector though, and the advances in technology are surging ahead. So that, the, that example you've just given in since 2016, the cost has fallen. An enormous amount of uh, progress has been made, um, but at the same time, these are pretty much all pre-revenue companies and uh, with the current funding environment and you know, the inflationary shock that we've all experienced and interest rates spiking, uh, leading there to be a sort of a, a very meaningful cost of capital now, that is an issue that all of our portfolio companies are contending with. Um, but the good news is we've begin to, begun to see markets loosen up a little bit. Uh, we got a 30 million euro funding round done for Meetable uh, just in the last month or so. And we've got a number of other uh, pretty major funding events coming through our portfolio and probably before the end of the year. So those, um, those funding events, do they, are they at higher valuations or are they lower valuations? Uh, they are at higher valuations. So it's growing, the industry's growing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that is in stark contrast to uh, a lot of other sort of sectors out there like software and uh, things. You know, the, you, there was a significant hype cycle uh, in 2021 uh, the plant-based alternative proteins uh, led this substantially. You had Oatly and Beyond Meat with uh, peak market valuations of over $14 billion. Uh, and unfortunately today, they are both sub $1 billion and uh, you know their future is very uncertain. Um, that has caused significant frustration for our companies, because our portfolio companies, um, even though they're really differentiated and have products that, that we think are uh, much better and, and really do meet uh, you know, the sensory profile expectations of meat eaters. Um, it, it just has caused investors uh, significant concern and wonder if these products will be taken up once they're available in large scale. I'm glad you brought those two companies up because we have seen a, a huge spike in, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, sort of fake meat companies, imitation meat companies. Yes. But it, we must be clear that these are not the same as the cellular agriculture companies yeah, that you're right. talking about. Yeah, so our overarching thesis is that it is very difficult to change consumer behavior uh, in the short term. So it's much easier to apply technology to produce the things that consumers have been consuming already, just produce them more efficiently. So you do get parity in terms of uh, sensory profile. I've had uh, four different species from six different companies uh, in, you know, in terms of these cell culture products. And I can tell you firsthand that these products uh, are good enough to have repeat purchases. And, and that, this is from someone who avoided the, the plant-based uh, hype cycle simply because I tried the products. And while I don't think that they're terrible, I just never believed that they'd be good enough to convert um, meat eaters en masse. Because that's exactly what's happened. I mean, you've seen it with Beyond Meat that yep. it's just completely uh, failed to hit any of its growth expectations. Yeah, that's right. The, the repeat purchasing just is not there. And that is driven by sensory profile. There's also issues around cost. They are more expensive, and, but they're getting squeezed at the, uh, the gross profit margin. But then you also have uh, pretty significant uh, concerns and activity coming from, I think, the uh, uh, incumbent industry, the meat industry, with neg negative signaling about uh, you know the, how processed they are, high levels of sodium, high levels of saturated fats. 
um, but they kind of need those in order to meet that sensory profile because they're lacking in, in so many other ways. Do you think their rise and subsequent fall has impacted the alternative meat and protein market? Yeah, I think that there is a real challenge that has been caused by you know, their demise. Um, and maybe they've actually, even though originally they did a great job of raising the awareness of how damaging uh, conventional animal agriculture is on the natural environment, uh, now that they haven't met expectations, it's really caused consumers as well as investors uh, concern and made them consider whether or not they want to invest in the precision fermentation and cell culture products because they, they obviously don't want to get caught um, by the same trap. But like I said earlier, I think that these products are good enough to get the repeat purchases. The only challenge that remains in front of cell culture and precision fermentation is can it be done at an industrial scale and at a price point that is competitive, if not cheaper, than conventional agriculture. In fermentation process, I don't think any of our viewers will have heard about before, and then even for me, it's a fairly alien concept. Yes. Could you just explain what that is and what, the, what companies are trying to achieve with yeah. it? So um, over the last 18 to 24 months, agronomics has really uh, increased its focus on precision fermentation. Um, and the reason that we've done that is because we recognize that the market is looking for nearer term revenue opportunities and, and, and profitable companies. And this is a technology that has actually been used commercially since 1978. Um, the uh, biotech company Genentech was the first to commercialize a product uh, and in human therapeutics. This is uh, insulin for type two diabetics. Um, and prior to the use of precision fermentation to produce insulin, uh, Genentech and Novo Nordisk, the other major company, had to derive their insulin from the pancreases of pigs. There were 10,000 pancreases for one kilogram of insulin, uh, and that was a very dirty process. So now 99.9% .9 of all insulin uh, is produced using uh, precision fermentation, and Novo Nordisk is now uh, one of the most valuable uh, companies in pharma companies in the whole of, of Europe. So what we're doing with precision fermentation is applying a very well-established, very cheap technology uh, to a brand new area. Um, but what has allowed us to go after that um, is that the cost of genetically modifying these organisms has come down several orders of magnitude over the last 20 to 30 years. So instead of pursuing ultra high value products, hum human therapeutics like insulin, you can turn it on its head uh, and produce proteins which are required in vast quantities like dairy and eggs, uh, but are relatively uh, low value uh, in nature. So this is a, m a much more established technology than creating proteins from scratch. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's, um, yeah, like I said, it's, it's just applying a, a very old technology to a, a new application. And that is why we have such high conviction that in time, when the infrastructure for this industry gets built out, um, you know, we just won't need animals uh, for the most part for, for those products. So could you tell me then, give, give an example of a company that is using that process to develop an animal product? So Onigo is uh, one of our very high conviction investments. Uh, this is a company based in Finland. It has a license to a technology from VTT, which is the, which is the Finnish state funded uh, uh, research uh, institute. Um, it has a license to produce egg proteins using a, uh, an organism called Trichoderma ricci. This is a very well proven, uh, what you call a protein expression platform. Um, and although they are only just over a year old, there is significant interest uh, from investors, from strategic investors, including users of that protein and, and uh, yeah, the avian flu and the fluctuation of the price of egg white or albumin specifically um, is really what is driving um, this, this major interest. Could you give our uh, viewers a bit more of a in-depth expl explanation about what that actually is this protein expression platform. Yeah, so you take an organism, a protein expression platform, whatever that might be, you insert the code for the protein that you want it to produce. And in a process that is uh, akin to brewing beer, you feed the organism sugars uh, and it metabolizes those sugars and converts them into, uh, into the target protein. You then need to sort of uh, get the organism open and get that protein out. But at the end of that process, you have a white powder, which is pure uh, albumin, 
and that can be used in uh, baked goods, it can be used in cakes, cookies, whatever you want, and it functions in exactly the same way because it is chemically identical uh, to the, uh, the conventionally produced protein. And those organisms are just much more efficient than feeding chickens, getting them to lay eggs, um, and, and extracting the protein uh, from, from their egg white. You say it's, a, it's exactly the same. This yes. is not a mishmash of other ingredients created to so t- make something that tastes like it. This is an exact replica of that exact protein. Exact replica, yeah, that's right. And you know, in the context of precision fermentation, because uh, those proteins are used in relatively low quantities in things like cakes uh, and, and other baked goods, we don't think the consumer will even notice the difference. In fact, they have no reason to, they would have no reason to notice the difference just un- unless they uh, read the label, which uh, needs, needs to note that. But if you are allergic to egg proteins uh, from a conventional source, you'll be allergic to these because like I said, they're exactly the same. So the, the, the beginning market for these products is going to be the ingredients market? Uh, yes, and, and a B2B play with primarily. We're not, uh, we're not talking about a nice Friday on a Sunday breakfast. Uh, well, we're not looking to produce the egg yolks, right? That's a different combination yeah, okay. of lipids. Um, but it, you, I mean, you could make an egg white omelette out of this. I've had the opportunity to have it in the, in the form of meringues and, and, and uh, the like. Um, but uh, yeah, not, uh, no sunny side up, unfortunately. It's, it's complex, but it's also quite straightforward, really. You are just producing one one type of protein that's easily able, you're easily able to replicate it without any of the mess. Yeah, yeah. It, it, look, and that's why we're so excited by it. And it, what is, I think, pretty extraordinary is that our, you know our portfolio speaks to the breadth of disruption that is coming to conventional agriculture. Yet the awareness of this technology uh, is actually really uh, quite low. Con- you know, consumers and investors that I speak with still confuse what we're doing with the plant-based alternatives. Um, so we're doing what we can to try and uh, you know, change that perception and educate uh, consumers and investors. What, what do you think uh, is the sort of uh, market potential here? Obviously, you could take over the whole industry, but yes. we're still away f- far away from that. But sort of the five, 10 years, what's the market scope? Well, uh, you know, the meat industry is $1.1 trillion. Dairy is $800 billion. Eggs is $400 billion. Seafood is three or $400 billion. So we're talking about a multi-trillion dollar total uh, addressable market. It is going to take a very long time to build the infrastructure needed to make even a slight dent uh, in that. And I think there's an analogy to be drawn between what's happening with renewables and fossil fuels. You know, $2.2 trillion has gone into renewables since the Paris Climate Accord was signed uh, in 2017, and uh, renewables account for 1% of total energy production today. Uh, but What is most important is that renewables and solar farms in particular have proven that they're economically attractive to institutional investors. So once we build the first large scale facility that proves that this technology can produce a large amount of protein uh, and uh, very importantly, is economically viable throwing off cash, then the the institutional investors and uh, capital will really start to flow. And, uh, you know, the Good Food Institute estimates that $1.8 trillion is going to need to go into this industry to meet just 10% of the world's protein production requirements. Um, but to 10%, 10%, 10.8 trillion. Yeah, yeah. that's right. But, uh, you know, which is so is on par with renewables. But I also uh, hasten to add that we don't think that there's any other way that the world can feed, uh, you know, the growing population without uh, eating itself and, and destroying or, or causing irreversible damage to the natural environment. How far away are we from the first profitable farm that produces egg white yeah. powder? Yeah, well, look, that's the, that's the million dollar question, but I, I think we're probably five years away from for a product company seeing really material revenues and, and, and profit. But um, take Liberation Labs in our portfolio, for example, this is the infrastructure play and, and quite different to um, all the other companies in our portfolio. Uh, when they complete the construction of their facility, which should be uh, around 2020, the first, first uh, quarter of 2025, they will have a facility that is generating free cash flow, um, you know, significant amounts of positive free cash flow. Uh, and that will allow our product companies, the egg companies, the dairy companies, to use their facility and start producing meaningful amounts of protein. But that facility, uh, as far as we can identify, is the world's first 
large-scale precision fermentation facility dedicated to food production. And it's part of your portfolio. And, it, and we own uh, about 35% of it. Yeah. Why, why do you think more people are not getting involved? Is it like a Unilever goes, it's got three, four billion dollars, euros a year in free cash flow, why can't they get involved? Well, I think the perception is that this is still early and, and risky. But you can't get away from the fact that the entire private funding markets uh, for companies which are for the most part, pre-revenue uh, has is really struggling um, at the moment. But you know, we are beginning to see signs that uh, new investors uh, are coming into the field. But we will get to the point where we are able to, you know, build facilities which have ready-made clients and end users, essentially off-take agreements like you achieve in uh, in, in mining. Uh, and and we think that that will bring a lot of capital into the sector. And I just want to build out on this point that this is not necessarily a thing we've got to replace meat. It's about building something to complement the existing farming infrastructure to feed the world. That is exactly right. We, we are many, many decades away from truly displacing any meaningful amount of uh, conventional animal protein, like the energy transition, which I continue to use as an analogy. Um, you know, we, it, it's it, to, to truly displace uh, meaningful amounts, we're going to need uh, trillions of dollars um, so it's, uh, look, but the economic viability is going to be proven out long before these products are broadly available on the shelves of Sainsbury's. Mm -hmm. And I, you've also got to consider the growth in emerging markets to so the population there, that this, the, the world is already struggling to feed itself with climate change as well. Yeah, that's right. You know, if you're talking about one or two percent incremental growth across a one point one trillion dollar meat market, you know, one facility is definitely not going to offset that one percent growth, right? We're going to need, uh, it, it's just a matter of keeping up with uh, growing demand. And then in time, we can start to displace um, uh, yeah, uh, animal agriculture. So I don't think the farmers need to be running scared uh, just yet. It's, it's, a, it's a long runway, but if you get in at the beginning, the re potential returns could be trillion trillion dollar returns. Yeah, certainly, uh, you know, you need to generate returns which are commensurate with the risk that um, is being taken. Uh, of course, our view on the risk, particularly around precision fermentation, given it's such an established technology, uh, are, are different to people that are coming at this sort of uh, from an outside perspective. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, there are companies that are producing dairy proteins uh, in 500,000 litre fermentation vessels, single tanks, right? So th this is already being done at very large scale. Okay, well, that, that, that in itself is quite interesting that we are, that this is not something, a future. This is not a future. F precision fermentation is definitely not in the future. It is here and it's now. It's here right now, and yeah. it's just about achieving scale. Yeah. Well, one of the companies you've got in your portfolio that's really fascinating potential and the idea is uh, Solar Foods. Yes. So I was wondering if you could talk about what that company does and why you like it. So Solar Foods, um, yes, is a, a very unusual company. Uh, it's based in Finland, again, with technology spun out of uh, VTT. And uh, they have identified a microbe called, a, a specialized microbe called a hydrogenotroph. Uh, this metabolizes hydrogen and CO2 and, uh, and grows and, and uh, forms uh, protein, which you can uh, use as a nutritional supplement, or it could uh, ultimately be used to displace soy and uh, pea protein. Um, but it's a very efficient form of uh, protein production uh, and it will be carbon neutral at scale because as long as you produce the hydrogen that you use for the process uh, using uh, renewable energy. So, you know, this company has uh, already got its protein approved in Singapore, uh, expecting approval uh, in other jurisdictions in, in the relatively near term. Uh, so, uh, yeah, a really, uh, really interesting asset. So it's producing protein from hydrogen? Uh, yes, that's right. You have to make the hydrogen in the first place. You've got to make the hydrogen, yes. And is that identical? Uh, well, it's not a, a protein that has been consumed historically. It's not trying to replicate beef or pork or chicken or anything like that. Uh, it is, uh, it's a proprietary protein called uh, solene, and you eat the entire organism, which is different to precision fermentation, where the organism is used as a factory to produce, and you just get the tiny bit of protein out. This here, you're consuming the entire protein. And there are a number of other companies that are, are similar in nature, but are consuming more conventional sources of carbon, like sugars, in, in a, a 
conventional fermentation style. So would it be okay to liken it to a sort of protein bar? Uh, yes, some, something like that. A meal replacement that you can yes, you deploy to disaster it. areas or something like uh, that? Well, I mean, we want to have much broader applications than that, but yes, it I, could I, be. Yeah. I've got in mind there's a, pro, uh, there's a peanut bar. You, they yeah, yeah, that's right. High, you you could incorporate power. its yeah. protein into that um, to, to boost the protein content. So it's really easy, potentially cheap to replicate highly yes. nutritious product that's created from hydrogen. Indeed, yeah. And solar energy. Yep. That's fascinating. And then there's another clean food group is a company that you also own. Yeah, look, this is a, uh, a very exciting uh, UK-based uh, company using fermentation for the production of a palm oil replacement. I say replacement because it, what it's producing is a, f uh, a fatty acid profile that is identical to the applications uh, where palm oil is uh, broken down into its uh, fractions. So you need a different fractionate for uh, use in margarine than you do in shampoo or, or what have you. But you know, palm oil certainly has a very bad reputation uh, and it is ubiquitous. It is quite extraordinary how many products that you consume on a daily basis where palm oil is, uh, uh, is included. And you know, about eight years of R&D have gone into clean food group prior to spinning it out from the University of Bath. Um, they just achieved a, another funding round, uh, I think about a month ago, uh, and um, are looking to scale up to 50,000 liters before the end of the year. So that's moving along very nicely. Like you say, palm oil is in everything, but ev as I'm understanding it, they, everything is a different type of palm oil. It's a different part of palm oil. Yeah, that's right. Just in the same way that when you extract crude oil from the ground, the crude oil is broken down into petrol, diesel, uh, you know, uh, all, all the different components. Same thing happens with palm oil. And they can produce a certain type of palm oil for a certain type of it. Yeah, that's right. And they can adjust the characteristics depending on the end um, user's desires. So they could be a perfect uh, partner for Unilever, which produces all these different products that all have palm oil. Absolutely, absolutely. But again, scale is the challenge. Yeah. And, and some of these large companies like Unilever and Kellogg's in the case of egg proteins and, and others, uh, they often don't like uh, proteins produced from, or any inputs produced from a single point source. Right? They like to have multiple facilities. So there is this chicken and egg uh, scale up challenge in, in front of these companies, um, but it is being overcome uh, you know, it, it, and, it, and will be overcome in time. And there is the, this opportunity with palm oil that it is such, having such a damaging impact. Palm oil production is having such a damaging impact on the whole world. Yeah. And this company can completely change all that. Yeah, exactly. In time. In time, in time. Yep, that's and very can, interesting. can completely displace palm. So is there, is there another business in your portfolio that you would be, you would like to like sort of shout about as the potential, because obviously palm oil is a really big one. Solar mm. food is a really big one. Is yep. there anything else that has that much potential to revolutionize so many different sectors? Uh, oh, so many different sectors. Um, I mean, I, I think it would be worth highlighting Blue Nalu because this is a really exciting application of cell culture technology. You know, I, I mentioned that you know, not all protein is created equal. It comes in different, uh, different price points, but uh, using cell culture pr to produce bluefin tuna um, is a really exciting application, not least because most unfortunately the oceans are literally running out of large fish. But with seafood, you have other uh, issues uh, around the bioaccumulation of toxins and heavy metals. So the bluefin tuna that is produced using our technology or Blue Nalu's technology um, will not have those heavy metals. And for instance, uh, pregnant women will be allowed to consume this uh, without uh, concern uh, uh, of that. Um, but you know, they're due to uh, achieve a funding round fairly soon. They are um, going to have their regulatory approval come through uh, in 2024. Um, and it's just a very well run, exciting business. That's, that's interesting because in this case, that could be a healthier protein alternative yep. than the actual protein alternative because of the heavy metals. Yeah, exactly. That you can just take out in, a, in the production process. Yeah. That is fascinating. And then, so I'm gonna move on to the investment company in general. Yep. And you're trading at a near 40% discount. Mm. Why do you think that is? Because I mean, you, as you've said earlier, that, that these companies are doing funding rounds yep. at higher valuations. So clearly they are worth more than yep. the market's valuing you at a significant discount. Yeah, um, look, it's just a very challenging market at the moment. And although you know, a circa 40% discount to NAV 
sounds uh, awful. Actually, our peer group is on average is trading at an even more significant uh, discount to its NAV. Um, this is clearly telling you that investors are, are querying the carrying value of our assets. Uh, although you know the UK has issues uh, specific to itself, uh, much more persistent inflation, cost of living crisis, uh, et cetera. And we do have a pretty uh, significant retail investor following um, owns about 50% of the, uh, the company. So there's been some selling pressure uh, on that front. But you know, as you said, um, we believe that the intrinsic value of our portfolio is actually even higher than what um, is stated under IFRS. But uh, you know, it's upon us to prove that these companies are worth uh, you know, what, what they're marked at. Um, and in time, these funding rounds should give investors the uh, additional comfort. You are, so, then, so that's important to illustrate that the funding rounds are showing that your valuations are conservative. Uh, yes, yes, that, that is correct. Without wishing... uh, I mean, they're not done yet, but uh, we have a very high degree of confidence that they will get done uh, a number before the end of the year. Um, but, you know, will investors believe it in this climate? Uh, it's still hard to, hard to know. Well, I mean, the, the whole opportunity here over the next 10 years, it's, it only seems like a matter of time before the market will have to catch up to what's actually happening in the real world. Yeah. I, I think so. But, you know, I, I think one thing that will change the perception uh, markedly is uh, getting a company like Liberation Labs funded, and then that will have, uh, you know, true free cash flow uh, and, uh, you know, larger institutional investors uh, will be able to value that on a net present value basis, right? You can do a proper spreadsheet and figure out um, uh, exactly what this thing is worth or, or you know, uh, really credibly think about it. Well, on that note, thank you very much for your time today. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Cheers.